Hello. Hi. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, all uh, soil people. My name is Alex. I'm Olmstead. Uh, together we are Alex, Alex and, and Olmstead. Uh, like Ryan said, we're a puppet theater company based in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And we specialize in live performance. However, since the pandemic, we are now also filmmakers. <laughs> We are friends with Ed Landa, as you know, wonderful soil scientist, and he brought um, brought us into this wonderful opportunity to create a puppet film inspired by soil. And you're about to see the world premiere of Earth Worm. So here we go. <laughs> I once heard someone say that life on Earth exists because there are six inches of topsoil and it happens to rain. The soil. The skin of the Earth. The critical source of terrestrial life as we know it. Some people look at it and say, ew, dirt. But I look at it and say, ooh, dirt. I love it so dearly. It's a provider. Food and vegetation, lumber and bricks, water filtration, carbon storage, fibers for clothing, antibiotics to fight diseases, the foundation for towns and cities. Like all truly special things in life, it is a non-renewable resource. As an earthworm, I have a very special relationship with soil. Autumn leaves, fallen trees, food waste. I eat so very much, I can even eat my own weight in soil. It's good to treat yourself sometimes. What I pass contains 10 times more nutrients than what I consume. Although this isn't a secret, saying it out loud still makes me blush. Sometimes the beauty around me is so profound, I have to pinch myself as a reminder. This is not a dream. This is my real life. I don't have lungs. So I breathe through my skin. How can I possibly explain to you how beautiful it feels to take long, languorous breaths through the skin of my entire being? It is my bliss. Many decomposing things provide to the soil. Someday, you will be useful in this way too. A team of Swedish researchers uncovered evidence that worms indeed feel pain. But I could have told you that. Just because I'm a romantic doesn't mean I don't feel scared sometimes. Other times, I look around me and wonder, how did I get so lucky? Excellent. 
And that was uh, Earthworm. I hope everything shared okay. Did it look okay to sound okay? Yeah, that was great, guys. I loved it. It was a very interesting, uh, very interesting way to do puppet work and and uh, kind of talk to our cause. So that was awesome. Thank you for that. Absolutely, our pleasure. Um, and uh, are we doing Q and A now, or or are we jumping into something else? I believe yeah. we're done with speakers, but uh, I'll let George kind of uh, see the rest of this thing. So. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Alex Olmstead. That was just that's just amazing. Thank you for sharing that, and that's wonderful work. And I, it's just it's just this is a what a what a story about earthworms. And the way you presented it was just so it was perfect. And your your personal lot, your giving that anthropogenic perspective uh, to to things that we don't usually do. And I think we I think it's important to do that because um, it puts. It puts us in the in their uh, skin, in the earthworm skin, in this case. So, thank you. Yeah, we we uh, we're gonna start with our um, our 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 Q and A, but I think um, we could go ahead with with any questions for well questions for you guys first and foremost. If 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 you want to work it that way, um, questions just start coming in, and we're go we're gonna be. Um, uh, f uh, fielding those questions out. So just uh, stand by and um, let's get to some questions. Thank you guys so much. And we can't wait to see your next performance. Oh, thank you. A little hint, little hint of what that might be. Uh, we actually have another piece that's premiering tonight as part of the Coney Island Puppet Slam. Uh, I believe if you go to ConeyIsland.com slash puppets, they're having a free slam tonight and we have another piece uh, in that. Um, uh, I'm also going to drop a link to uh, the video you just saw. I know sometimes when you share over Zoom, things can get a little a little wonky. Um, so if you want to watch it later, you can you can check it out at that link. I saw um, a question from Peggy Smith LaBeouf asking, "Was the worm real?" Great question. Great question. In fact, no, it was a puppet. That's why there were the little rods sticking out of it. It may have looked like you were we were poking a worm. Yes, and I have a surface right here so that we can demonstrate the movement a little yeah. bit more clearly. So uh, when we were thinking about this project and thinking, okay, well, who's who's sort of our the audience surrogate for the piece? Um, who's the main character that we're following? Uh, we of course had to had to get a worm because of course. they they live in soil, they eat soil, they make soil. It's it's amazing. Uh, so when we were thinking about, well, how, how are we going to make a worm puppet? Um, I first thought, okay, well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to carve one out of like a, a wax based clay, like monster clay or Chavant clay, and then do a plaster casting of that, a two part plaster mold. Then we can uh, create an armature for that and fill it with a silicone rubber that's tinted the right thing. Um, and then I thought, oh, you can buy a fishing lure um, and it's already rubber. Uh, so we bought a pack of fishing lures. But the trick is in the movement. It isn't so much it's just like, well, yes, this is a great material to work with. This, this wonderfully one flexible rubber, but it's also in how to, how to insert the, the manipulation rods, which we'll right. go into. So, uh, so you see there are two control rods that go to the worm. And in the end, you can't see it but the end of the rods end in a little 90 degree bend that only goes up about half an inch. This one going this way and that one going that way. And they're actually sort of pushed into the worm and then down, but then that lets you rotate the rod and get that movement too. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, if you hold your hand out. Surely. Um, uh, flat, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know up. which way. <laughs> um, and a little, yeah. Uh, so that way, rather than just going like that, if you roll it up, you can have it uh, sort of do that inchworm movement or look around and focus and look in different directions. It's a little uncanny, even when we're working with it. There are moments when it seems like it's a real worm. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and it ended up being a, um, uh, a big community uh, builder too. When we were yes. working on the film, we were working in our, our driveway, sort of hunched over this little worm filming some of the things. Uh, and the neighbor kids would, you know, sort of come by and be like, what are you doing? 
and we'd explain, well, we're making a film about soil and we'd talk to them about soil a little bit and we could let them play with the puppet and test it out and film them doing it. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> we met so many people who were interested and, and so many people who tried out the puppet themselves. It was a great, great organizing effect. Here, here. <laughs> Uh, Peggy smith Leboff also asked, was that your cat? Uh, no, our cat is uh, Clementine. She's an orange cat, but she was an outdoor cat at one point. <laughs> the cat that appeared in the film is a neighborhood cat named Nero. Named oh, Flounder. Named Flounder. <laughs> this is Flounder. important details, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. And Flounder uh, got very interested in the worm. Um, so it's one of those moments where uh, you just keep filming and play with it, and then something something magic happens. Yeah. That's just fantastic. Can we, can we just a little bit more background on, on, I mean, what got you started in um, wanting to use uh, art for ecology's sake, for sustainability's sake, conservation? Yeah, I think um, uh, definitely this this symposium uh, is sort of the most directly let's use art to uh, to talk about ecology um, but what really got us interested in in sort of using objects to tell stories uh, we met on a show about 10 years ago um, we're also just regular theater actors and we got cast in a show that involved a lot of puppetry um, and uh, something about puppetry um, that's really special that really draws us to, to sending a message through object performance or, or telling a story like that um, is when when you have a, a, a character like the worm um, or, or like any other puppet that is a uh, sort of a simplified abstracted uh, version of a character is that it lets you as an audience project all of your experiences and your emotions onto that character. Right, so when you're watching uh, a movie or a TV or a play with a human actor in it, you're you're watching them and you're watching their thought process, and it tells you everything you need to know. Right, it doesn't engage your imagination as much. I mean, it, it yeah, it's it's with it with an object, it it mean, engages you much more directly. You have to you have to suspend your disbelief quite willingly in order to allow this character, this object, this inanimate object, to have feelings. Right. And to to engage you and to make you feel things. And that something about about that direct engagement with an audience allows exactly. for allows for an emotional connection that's much stronger. And so in terms of art and ecology, that's a it's a really lovely pairing because so much is also about perspective and getting getting um, concepts that could be otherwise more cerebral in a, in a place of real heart and direct um, direct feeling. Yeah, I think too what's what's interesting to us about um, uh, about telling sort of these kind of stories, ecology stories and science stories through uh, through puppets or through art is that uh, it makes the audience, connect with it in a more a more personal way, a more sort of core within them kind of way. Um, especially uh, if, you know, like in the in the instance of the worm, it's sort of forcing the audience to see the world through the perspective of the worm. Um, so uh, I think it it makes them empathize with the situation of ecology and and the importance of soil uh, more than just if if they read it in a textbook and said, oh, soil is important for these reasons. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. It was, it was, you, you personalized it. I mean, the narrative was great. The way you put those clips in and the different scenes. I mean, I was absolutely empathizing. I may be biased towards sustainability and ecology, <laughs> but I was, I, I was, I was, wait, I was saying to myself, wait, did, did they say the name? Cause I, we didn't give a name. There wasn't a name to the worm, but if you didn't know anything about earthworms or knew very little, you certainly learned a whole lot through through this through this video. And I think that's uh, the narrative was just it was just great. So yeah, uh, totally.
brought me into that small space where the earthworm lives and all the things that the earthworms do. And on a, on a sim simplistic level, it's it's just a beautiful it's a beautiful thing that earthworms do, and I think few people think about it. And the, but it, but it also brings to light the bigger picture of a lot of what we need to understand as as, as far as repurposing and recycling and re regenerative agriculture and all the things that the, a lot of the folks have been talking talking about today. So that's just fantastic. I'll, I'm I'm hogging up the time here. Does anyone want anybody come on up and say something and? Turn on your microphone. Anyone except Paul Mankiewicz? Anyone <laughs> except Paul? Just kidding. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm happy to be included. I actually wrote this out, too. That's absolutely beautiful. I, I'm hoping that you can build the five loving hearts and 500 million years of learning evolutionary history into your narrative. Anyway, it's just a beautiful thing. The, the earthworm has literally sculpted the soil since, since it's been here. Actually, since if the plants made the soil, the earthworm has been thinking about it for something like 80 million years before the plants emerge. That's a great point. I love that. Actually, if you look really, cl <laughs> really closely, the five loving hearts were built into it. We had to use um, a Maryland State Arts Council grant to build working hearts. Um, they're functional. It's just beautiful. Thanks. Thank you, Paul.